Well, we find ourselves in this kind of weird spot because I've never done this before and, and so we're going to try this. What I'm going to do this morning is, is give us a recap of 2 Timothy. We will start the firm foundation mini-series next week, but this week what I thought would be helpful, encouraging, perhaps challenging a bit, is to look back over 2 Timothy. So I spent all of Monday just going over those four chapters again and again and again and again. And by the time I was done Monday afternoon, I had all these outlines. And I did not know exactly where the Lord wanted me to go. And as I prayed and sought Him, it became very clear where I should go this morning. Where I... Where I'm going is someplace that at times I, I just kind of put on the burner. I tend not to think of being that important to my walk with God. And perhaps you can relate with me this morning. If you were to ask me what my three pillars of my walk with God are, well, I might ask you first. Say, well, what are yours? What, what I would say is for sure God's sovereignty. It, it is what I trust in over and over and over again as, as times come and things just get flipped upside down right in front of me. And I don't know exactly where straight is, but I know who is straight. I know who's in control of all things. So God's sovereignty is something I hold to that I remind myself that the Lord reminds me of continually. And, and then sanctification that the Lord is making me more like himself. And he's using all these circumstances to accomplish that. Third would be the sinfulness of man, total depravity. Why? Because as I look around and I see things just escalating and getting more and more crazy and people acting more and more crazy, I, I look at it through the grid of man's sinfulness and it, and it makes sense to me. And I see in that God's grace. And all of this would be overriding with God's grace being extended to me. And although I could have touched upon those things in 2 Timothy, where, where I landed is, is something that I would consider the starting point of Christianity. Do you, do you know what that is? How would you answer that question? For you, what is the starting point of Christianity? Where does your relationship with God begin? And then does it stop there? Well, if you've already looked at the the title of the sermon this morning, I thought about not even putting it in your notes so that you wouldn't be given a little bit of a heads up, but I've entitled this sermon this morning, The Importance of Faith, and that is what we will see. Do you understand truly what biblical faith is and what it looks like and how significant it is? And always the best place to start is with the definition. How would you define biblical faith? How would you define saving faith? The Puritans had a sweet way of defining faith. And this is what they say, or what they said. It's now in writing for us. It's the resting of the heart on God. Isn't that sweet? The resting of the heart on God, who is the author of life and eternal salvation, so that we may be saved from all evil, through him and may follow all good. Let me say that again. The Puritan's definition of faith, the resting of the heart on God, the author of life and eternal salvation so that we may be saved from all evil through him and may follow all good. Faith is what? Taking us somewhere. Do you recognize that? Do you see that in your own life? Since the moment that you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, that you repented of your sins and, and turned towards the Lord, how has faith manifested itself, worked itself out in your life? Is it visible by others? Do you believe that faith is something that's even visible by others? Is it something that I could see? Is it something that your family can see? Or is it just something that stays inside of you? I don't believe that we do justice 
to the idea of faith, to looking at it from a biblical perspective, if we didn't at least spend just a small little amount of time in Hebrews 11. So please turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and let's see how God and his word defines what faith is. Because this truly is what faith is. It, it not only is a resting of the heart on God, it is the assurance of things hoped for and conviction of things not seen. That is what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11. Faith, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. This word assurance in the, in the Greek, I don't usually talk about the Greek and what the words mean, but this is oh so significant and oh so sweet. It's hypostasis. Hypo, or I'm sorry, stasis comes, that, that's the root of it. And, and that means to stand. And then, and then the, the hypo part means under. It's, it's talking about a foundation. We need to think like a foundation of a house. That that house is built upon something solid and firm so that that house stays solid and firm for a long time, right? We don't know what this is like because our houses here generally are built on solid foundations. The nearly 20 years that we lived in Papua New Guinea, I saw houses over and over again topple over. Why? Because they weren't built on a solid foundation. They were built on this ironwood posts that were extremely strong. But what happened over time is the, the, those posts would start to give away. And then before you know it, that house would shift. And it'd be like this one day. And then all of a sudden it would get way over like this. And if the people were really crazy, they'd keep living in it. Why? Because they did not have a solid foundation. So the starting point of our relationship with God is here. It is in faith. Faith in that which we cannot see, but that we stand upon, even though we cannot see it. And as that faith works itself out, you see it as an outward manifestation in the life of so many. In fact, the author, and we don't know who he is, of the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, what does he do? He, he gives us this long line of those that have gone before us in years past, before Jesus ever came. That's where this line starts. And it's this long line and what the Lord is challenging us and what I want to challenge us all this morning is get in that line and follow along with those that have gone before us recognizing that, that faith isn't just something that we are saved through at the moment of salvation, but it is the way that we are to live our lives. Until, as we, as we just sang, our faith is turned into sight. But does faith have some sort of outward manifestation to it, some sort of fruit? Well, yes, look at Hebrews chapter 11. And let me just give us some highlights as we don't have time to go through and give an exposition all the way through, but this is so significant. How time and time again we see those that are held up as models of the faith that they actually lived a certain way. Following God, walking with God by faith. Look at Enoch in verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. You know what it says about Enoch? It says that he walked with God and then he was no more, for God took him. How would you like that written on your tombstone? How sweet would that be? You walked with God and then God said, man, I want you with me. And how significant is faith? It's so significant that you can't please God without it. But don't take my word for that. Look at what the author of Hebrews says in the very next verse. After saying that Enoch was a man that pleased God, he then articulates this. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. 
Why is that so significant? Because you can't see God. And so our life is a life of faith. But that doesn't mean that it's not based on truth because God's word is truth. And so what we're going to see is we're going to see faith and truth and God's word coming hand in hand. That our faith is informed by the word of God. That our faith is strengthened and grows as a result of our time in God's word. And you can't pull one from the other. They're intrinsically intertwined. And so it is without, without faith, you just can't please the Lord. Look at Noah. Again, this aspect of not being able to see what's happening or what is going to happen. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and he became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You see, Noah didn't know what a flood was. He actually didn't even know what a boat was. And yet, what did he do? He took God at his word and said, okay, yes, I haven't seen a flood most likely never saw rain, I haven't seen a boat, but you know what? I believe what you are saying, and I'm going to act on that belief. And then we know from what Second Peter has to share with us that, that Noah also was a man who was a preacher of righteousness. And so people would come, and what would he do? He'd point them to God, say, hey, do you know why I'm building this boat? Because judgment is coming, and it's coming upon you, and you must repent and turn to Yahweh today. And what would they do? They'd ridicule him. And this went on for years and years and years. And then look at verse 17 in Abraham. Such a, a challenge to see what Abraham believed. By faith, verse 17, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise promises was offering up his only begotten son it was he to whom it was said in Isaac your descendants shall be called he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which he also received him back as a type so what did Abraham believe literally when he put the the knife up to kill his own his really his only son Isaac he literally believed that God could raise him up from the dead right there and then and as a result, we see God saving Isaac, being pleased with Abraham's faith. What about Moses? We see Moses in verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. 27, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. That's a pretty sweet definition of faith. As seeing him who is unseen. Lived his entire life walking with the Lord as though he could see him and had a relationship with him as though he were someone that he could see that he spent time with every day. Is that, is that what your relationship with the Lord is like? If I was going to pull everything away on a definition for faith, I would say it's this. It's not relying on ourselves, but receiving and resting on him. Have you ever thought of faith being the opposite of pride? We tend to only think of humility being the opposite of pride, but honestly, the opposite of true biblical faith and saving faith is relying upon yourself, which is what pride is all about trying to do everything ourselves, trying to earn our own way, trying to make our own way. And what true biblical faith is, it's the opposite. It's looking at God and saying, okay, you can handle everything. In fact, it's so much better in your hands than it is in mine, so I'm going to entrust my entire life to you. Here, you take it, and that might mean that you do that over and over again because of the way that we are. We don't even know that we've grabbed our own life back. And then we're looking at, oh, I need to give this back to you again. What else do we see? 
we see that biblical faith is a faith that is lived throughout the life of the believer. That these that we see in Hebrews chapter 11, their whole life was characterized by walking by faith. Just as Habakkuk 2.4 says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. Hebrews 3.14, We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Faith that comes from God never evaporates. It doesn't disappear. That's what we're going to see this morning. What we're going to see in 2 Timothy are are seven ways that the Lord highlights the importance of faith for us. And maybe a good way to, to think of it is to think of it like a diamond. What is the diamond? The diamond is faith. It is such a beautiful thing that changes everything. But, but faith isn't, isn't just one-dimensional. Remember, a diamond, man, you look at it from all sorts of different angles. What is it? It's still beautiful, but it's different from over here, even though it's still the diamond. And that's what faith is. That's what we're going to see this morning. We're going to see how, how the Lord shows us how wonderful faith is. And we might have missed this as, as we went verse by verse through 2 Timothy. But it's oh so clear to me as I look back on it now. And what do we see first? We see first this dimension of sincere faith. That's what true biblical faith is. It is sincere faith. It is that faith which is genuine, which, which is without pretense. And we see this, notice, right from the beginning. After Paul kind of welcomes, or gives his greeting to Timothy and lets Timothy know how much he loves him and how much he thanks the Lord for him, then what does he go into? First, before he gets into anything else, he talks about his sincere faith. Look at verse 5, chapter 1. And this, the first of seven ways that the Lord highlights is a sincere faith. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. This is a faith that is genuine without pretense, that doesn't have all the extra baggage that you want out of this, which is what the false teachers were all about. What did they want? They, they wanted prestige. They wanted money. They wanted all sorts of things. That's why they were being the teachers that they were, but they were deceived. And their faith was anything but sincere. It was insincere. It was wrongly focused. Instead of being focused on Christ and honoring him, it was focused upon themselves. And notice how Paul phrases this. He says, I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you. Okay, within you, Timothy, I've seen it. But he hasn't just seen it in Timothy. Even before Timothy, we have to assume that his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice were in a relationship somehow with Paul, that they were going to this church, that perhaps Paul even was involved in sharing the gospel with them by which they got saved. We don't know, but what we do know is that Paul could see sincere faith in each of them. So what does that reveal to us? That reveals to us that faith is identifiable. It's something that can be seen. At least it's something that should be seen. And this is what has been a challenge for me this week in my own life. Man, can people see my faith? And as they look at it, would they deem my faith sincere? Would they look at me and look at my life and say, yes, there is a man who is genuine in his faith. He is without pretense. There is nothing else mixed in with, with Jason and his relationship with the Lord. It's all about Christ. And can they see that? Can you see that? Can my family see that? But what is also oh so telling for me that is so encouraging is how he said that this faith came which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois. This word means to live in, to reside, to dwell. Literally, it's to take up an abode. And in, and in the Greek, this, this can have a, a nuanced meaning that means it's, it's an inception of something. It's when it begins, it's when it starts. 
And so in this, we see that this is the gracious gift of God on them. Not that it was passed on because, oh, well, because your mom believed, then you're going to believe, and because your grandma believed, she believed. No, it's an individual thing that happens with each one of us, but we see here that it's sourced in God's wonderful grace. Gracing us with this faith. This is oh so clear in Philippians. Chapter 1, verse 29. Listen to what it says there. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake two things. Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for Christ's sake. That's why we can take suffering to the bank and know that it's going to happen. We're all going to suffer. Because God's word says that it is, and, and as an extension has been granted. That's grace. Been graced with faith. We've been graced with suffering. Why? Because of what suffering does in and through us. And because how our faith is to be lived out. And in this, this sincere faith that is not only genuine, but it is clearly identifiable. Who would you think of as you think of those characters that we looked at in Hebrews 11 that would represent someone with sincere faith? I would say it would be Noah. He had years and years and years of an opportunity to show that his faith was not sincere and that he could cave in and that he would say, you know what, I'm done with this. Too many people have come and asked me what a flood is, why I'm building this boat. How come it hasn't happened yet? But instead, what we see is that he was able to be faithful throughout the entire time that he was building this ark and still being a preacher of righteousness. So in the same way that we see this kind of faith in Noah, we see it here in Timothy and in his grandma and in his mom and and then passed on to us that this is, should be the kind of faith that we see in our lives. Sincere faith. Oh, what a challenge that is. But the next one is equally challenging but in a very encouraging way and that is not only is, is this biblical faith sincere but it is oh so secure it is a secure faith and we see this in chapter 1 verses 12 to 13 look at what it says it is secure and it's secure because of who it is based upon for this reason I also suffer these things but I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. All of that verbiage is verbiage that's pointing towards faith. When you believe, your faith, you're putting your faith in. When you're convinced, that's, that's what happens when your faith then becomes even more than conviction. You then become convinced of it. And then look what he says in 13, retain the standard of sound words. Why? Because God's word and your faith are attached You can't have one without the other. You're not going to grow in your faith without spending time in God's word. So retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And what does he root everything into regarding our faith? He roots it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the freedom there is in that? If If it's rooted in your faith and how much faith you have, Well, then maybe today, this morning, you're good. Because right now, nothing's happening that's testing your faith. And you still believe God to be as faithful as you did yesterday. But tomorrow, what's going to happen when you get that call from the doctor? And then your your, your faith is tested. And perhaps at that time, instead of your faith being this big, your faith grows to be this little bit. And you're wondering if you can hold on. But see, what we see here is that our faith isn't based upon how much faith we bring in. Our faith is based upon the object of our faith. And that is who? The Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, it is unwavering. It will not be tossed and turned, taken away from us. Instead, it is secure. More secure than anything that we could find on this planet whether that's granite or whether that's diamond or I don't know what the hardest thing is you could build a house out of, but whatever that is, Jesus is more hard than that, more secure. And that is what Paul is pointing Timothy to, saying don't forget about this. 
Don't forget about walking with our God by faith, Timothy. It means everything to us. And that he will get us home. And that all that we entrust to him is secure in his oh-so-capable and loving and gracious hands. Okay, turn with me to Jude. This, this is such a sweet verse. Or a couple verses. The last two verses of the book of Jude. To show us that this wasn't just Paul's understanding. Jude understood this. That our faith is totally secure because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jude breaks off into a doxology, a, a couple verses of praise, giving praise and adoration to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is so secure. And our salvation is secure in him. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, he will get you home. That's what Paul was saying to Timothy. That's what Jude is saying, the same exact thing. That is what the Lord is saying to us. And to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So we see that it is a secure faith. What do we see third? We see this. It is a saving faith. And I could have gone to a couple different passages, but let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Because we see here in saving, I am talking about taking us from death, bringing us to life. For we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. No one was righteous. No one was seeking after him. But by his wonderful grace, he saves us through faith. And as a result, this faith is most assuredly a saving faith. And I'd like to define saving faith in this. Trusting in Jesus as a living person for forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God. Trusting only in Jesus as he is the way, the truth, and the what? The life. There is no other way to the Father but through him. And we see this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we have been identified with him in his death. By what? By faith in him. If that is the case for you and you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you put your faith in him, then you have been identified with him in his death, that he was your substitute, that he took your place upon that cross, that his blood, blood shed was the payment for your sin. And as a result, what happens? As he raises, you raise. As he has life, you have life. As he is the giver of eternal life, you have been given that eternal life. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. How can we endure? Because this is a saving faith. This allows us to stand up under trials, as, as we will see shortly. But if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. A word to those who do not choose to place their faith in Christ. He will forever be faithful. And that means as being the just God that he is, all who deserve eternal torment in hell will receive that eternal torment, that punishment. Why? Because that is what God has said from the beginning is the punishment for sin. And all of us are sinners. So your future eternity hinges on what you do, what you believe in particular about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't just believe as the demons do that he is the son of God. You must believe that he is the savior that has paid the price for sin. So we see that it is indeed a saving faith. Turn with me to Luke. I believe this has got to be one of the most powerful illustrations of saving faith. 
For if there is anyone on the planet that, that you could read about in Scripture, you would think, well, no, there's got to be more to it than just believing. There's got to be more to it than faith. No, it's got to be what you do. It's, it's, it's your faith plus coming to church. Nope. There's faith alone. Sola fide, as the reformer said. Look at this. And all we know really about him is to call him the other thief on the cross. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuses at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God? Sorry, verses 39 to 40, Luke 23. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, pointing to Jesus on the cross, no doubt, has done nothing wrong. He's perfect. He's the son of God. We deserve this. We deserve to die as we all do. And then look at what Jesus says. On the basis of this man's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's all that he had. He was as good as dead. He For all intents and purposes, we could consider him a dying corpse that could still talk. His his life was going to be ended within hours. And what did he say? And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He recognizes that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is going to be bringing in God's kingdom, the eternal kingdom. And then he, Jesus, said to him, "Truly, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. This truly is an example of saving faith as this man within the last hours of his life who was about to slip into a Christless eternity was welcomed into the kingdom because he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ that he indeed was the Savior. So we see first a sincere faith that is also a secure faith that of course is a saving faith But along with that, what we see next is that it is a cleansing faith. Do you recognize that faith has work? That there is an outward manifestation of faith. We saw it in Hebrews chapter 11. Well, Paul brings it up to us here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 to 25. And actually the verses before this, what is Paul getting into? He's saying, hey, don't act like those guys, act like this presenting to Timothy and to the whole church in Ephesus, hey, you are to be holy as God is holy. That is what faith does. Faith has a work, has an agenda, and that agenda is to follow whatever God's plan is for us, which means to conform us into the image of Christ. So let me begin in verse 21, actually. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, pointing back to all these bad things that the false teachers were doing. Not accurately handling the word of truth, wrangling about words, upsetting the faith of some. He will be a vessel for honor if you cleanse yourself from this. Sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Hold on a minute, Pastor Jason. How do you pursue faith? I thought it was just something that was given to me. Well, it's given to you, but then what happens? You are involved in the process of sanctification. You are involved in what the Lord is doing in order to make you more and more holy. You don't just sit back in a chair. You pursue it. And that is what Paul is reminding Timothy. Hey, keep going after faith. And how do you go after faith? How do you grow your faith? You Stay plugged into the word of God. You walk on in holiness as the spirit of God empowers you to live a godly life. Faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. That's the other side of faith. The other side of faith is repentance. 
Faith is what you believe about God, that you believe that he, or about Jesus Christ, that he is indeed God and the Savior. Repentance is what you do about sin, that you recognize that you are a sinner and that you're turning away from that sin. That they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. What is this? This is cleansing faith. You see, true biblical faith does something. And as it works in us, we see in verse 21 what it does. It cleanses us so that we might be a vessel of honor, that we might live for his glory. And not only that, that we might be sanctified, that we might be set apart for him from sin. Useful to the master. And notice what it says, prepared for every good work. Just as Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says, it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In this, faith is, is, is an internal reality that has external consequences. It has fruit. And that's what we see in the book of James. So we see sincere faith, secure faith, saving faith, cleansing faith, and then we see this worthless faith. That's where Paul goes in chapter 3. He gives us an example of those that have worthless faith. But notice in chapter 3, verse 5, this faith actually looks like it's true biblical faith, true saving faith, holding to a form of godliness. Although they've denied its power, avoid such men as these. How have they denied its power? They've denied its power because they have not truly believed. Because they are still all about themselves. And you could see it in the fruit. The fruit is seen in verse, particularly in verse 2. They're lovers of self. They're lovers of money. They're boastful. They're arrogant. They're revilers. They're disobedient to parents. Everything that God says is good, they do the complete opposite. Why? Because their faith is not true faith. It is a worthless faith. And what Paul does is he gives us this representation so we know, oh, this isn't the beautiful diamond. This isn't the diamond of, of, of true biblical saving faith. This is an imposter. And assess yourself as to which faith you are. And we see that in the end, what are they? They are rejected in regard to the faith. They are rejected in regard to the faith. Verse 8, just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Notice how God's word again is, is held in with faith. You can't pull them apart. How is faith undermined? You undermine the word of God. Men of a depraved mind, why? Because they are not soaking in God's truth and allowing the word of God to be renewing their minds so instead their minds have stayed depraved. And look at who, how they will be. They'll be rejected in regard to the faith. This word rejected literally means not standing the test. Being unqualified or worthless. May that not be the case for any of us. And then what we see continuing on in chapter 3 is the complete opposite of this worthless faith. Faith We see a rescuing faith. That's a faith that will indeed rescue us. And I'm not talking so much about from death and eternal separation from God as I'm talking about practically in the life that we live right now. Because that's where Paul goes. That's where he goes in the very next verses. And notice again, he goes to the fact that faith is something that you can see in someone else and not only see it, but you can follow their faith. How do you do that unless you could actually see and faith is observable? Look at verse 10. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith. Timothy followed Paul's faith as well as his patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and listen to this, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Because that is what true biblical faith is, that the Lord will rescue you. Again, the whole context isn't that it seemed like he was rescued, but he didn't die in any of these circumstances. Even though they stoned him to death, left him for dead, no, the Lord said, nope, you're not dead yet. I still have plans for you. 
And, and what encouragement that is for us. No matter what you're going through today, nope, the Lord still has more planned for you. And what should you do? You should keep on walking by faith, trusting him, and trusting in him alone to see where he is going to lead you and guide you next. Just as these in the hall of fame that we saw in Hebrews chapter 11. So continue on in the things you have learned, no doubt pointing to the faith that was passed on, speaking of the truths of God's word, but also Timothy's own personal faith. And so we see clearly that it's rescuing faith. And this means rescuing not only from the punishment of sin, but the power of sin and, and one day from the very presence of sin and God and his goodness. And it's only done through faith in Christ, through faith and only faith. There is no other way to be saved except for faith in Christ. That is what Paul is getting at. As we see here, yes, this is a rescuing faith and notice where this faith leads. And the final aspect of this diamond of beautiful faith that we see represented in scripture is it's not just sincere it's not just secure it's not just saving it's not a just cleansing faith it's no it's not worthless faith but it's this rescuing faith and finally it is a rewarding faith chapter 4 verses 6 to 8 Paul sees this clearer than any other time in his life he recognizes that his life of faith has not been wasted that because it is secure, he knows that there is something waiting for him on the other side. When this departure comes, he doesn't look at death as something foreboding and terrible. He looks at it as a launch pad into something far greater. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Verse 6, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. Look at it as he, as he looks back on his life. He talks about fighting the fight. I finished the course. And then he says this, I've kept the faith. What's the implication? Timothy, keep your faith. Keep on keeping on. Stay centered in the word of God. Keep proclaiming the word of God. Keep walking each day by faith, just as I am. Until that time, when just as I am about to enter into, that faith will be turned to sight. And you will enter into the joy of the Lord. And at that point, you will receive the best reward that could ever be given. That no reward in this ground could even compare with this reward. And he gives us two aspects of this reward. Do you see what it is? In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. So what is the first reward? It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Do you recognize that that is what we will, will receive one day? That our Savior, our Lord, in, in his physical presence, will be there to meet us. Not just to meet us, but to extend by his wonderful grace, his righteousness, which we could say is eternity. Eternity with him. Welcome. Enjoy the kingdom with me my son, my daughter. Anything sweeter than that? When we look at all the death and destruction and gloom all around us, we have something that we are looking forward to that goes beyond anything that we could possibly dream up or imagine. And this isn't some pie in the sky heaven. Do you recognize that heaven's gonna be on earth? Do you, do you recognize there's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth? that God created us as physical beings, and so we're going to be enjoying a physical, eternal reality with Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is that part of the Godhead that he is in physical form. That we will worship him. That we will touch him. That we will fall down at his feet. We will step into that which is too good for words. It brings me back to Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. There's hardly anything mentioned about this guy. But do you know what it says? Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Talk about a great reward. 
really the first. He, he beat so many others. Why? Because he didn't have to wait to die. He just got to step right into his reward and receive it. And I recognize Jesus hadn't come yet, and there's all sorts of significance behind that, but the reality is God took him to be home with him. And he stepped right into enjoying a pure relationship with God. And what is so challenging to me about the life of Enoch is what it says that he walked with God. And then what it says in Hebrews that he pleased God. And we know from Hebrews eleven six 6 that the only way to please God is by faith. So then we can then conclude that, okay, if he walked with God and his walk with God was pleasing to God, then his walk with God must have been all about what? Faith. That as he walked with God day in and day out, all those 300 years, it was a walk by faith. As it were, to kind of hold God's hand and walk with him through everything that came Enoch's way. Is that the way that we look at faith? Is that the way that we understand faith? Is that our hope? The reward that is waiting for us because of this wonderful gift of faith. Let me close our time together as Pastor Shane and and Joyce come up. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are so, so good. Thank you for this, this letter of 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter to his, to his dying son in the faith, Timothy, or as Paul is dying to his living son in the faith, Timothy. Lord, what an encouragement. I thank you for the encouragement this morning of seeing what faith looks like. Grow our faith, Lord. I pray that if there is anyone here listening or viewing online who has not placed their faith in you, Lord Jesus, that that you would open their eyes now, that you would work in their hearts, that they would see that they are in a desperate state, that if they were to die right now, that they would be separated from you. Lord, I pray that you would give them the faith to believe in you, Lord Jesus, as their Savior. I thank you for what you did dying on the cross, being the atonement, being the propitiation, that God was pleased with what you did upon the cross, taking all of that sin upon yourself and dying in the place of sinners like me so that we might have an eternity with you continue to allow our time of worship to be honoring and glorifying to you as we respond in in song lord thank you for giving us the ability to sing to hear one another and may that as well spur us on to love you more and to walk with you by faith in jesus name amen